speaker is Dr. Lee Tesler, who has been with us now for a little over a year. He's chief of neurotrauma at the Winthrop Hospital, and he's going to give us a historical perspective on neurosurgery. When Alan asked me to give this talk, I, you know, I sort of asked him, what's the makeup of the audience here? And he told me, well, you have a handful of neurosurgeons, there's going to be some neurologists, some PAs, mostly neurosurgery, though. And so I thought, I could give a talk about GBMs, metastases, things like that, but uh, that's relatively boring stuff. Let's do something a little more interesting, get a little background on neurosurgery itself, where this all started. So I want you to picture this. You're an Incan warrior. It's 400 BC, and you find your enemy in the woods. What you're going to do is attack him, but what you're going to do is attack him in the best way possible, which is to go for that death blow. That's to the head. But what happens if you hit your enemy in the head? He's wounded, but he doesn't die. He's still awake, and he has this massive head injury. Well, your tribe is going to take you, and they're going to take you back to the village. And they're going to perform this very rudimentary operation called trepanation, which is to basically remove the bone fragments and create a hole in the skull to allow you to possibly survive. And this was practiced as much as 10,000 years ago. Trepanation, which is something I'm going to talk about for the most part today, doesn't really imply brain surgery. What trepanation refers to is making a hole in the skull. And that hole in the skull could be made either for some therapeutic reason or some other reason, which we'll get into. It is thought to have occurred approximately 10,000 BC, although there really was no written record for uh, until the last 2,000 years or so. And specimens are actually found from all over the world, and it's still practiced in some African uh, tribal communities. So what we're going to go through is sort of this basic history Although this has been going on for maybe 12,000 years or so, it wasn't really recognized by the current culture until around 200, 150, 200 years ago. And what was the motivation of these people? We know that sort of scientific enlightenment, the whole idea that the brain controls the body, that the brain controls movement, thinking, didn't really come about to very recently. So if people didn't know about this, why did they do this operation? the different techniques involved, and how the people did afterwards. So the first discovery was found in France in approximately 1685. It was found by a Benedictine monk named Bernard de Montfachon, and he didn't really understand why that was done at that time. He found this skull with a hole in it, and they sort of assumed that this was due to trauma. The same thing happened in 1816, a second specimen was found, but again, they didn't really understand the significance of it, and only later did they come to realize that that's what they were dealing with. In 1839, there was a book entitled Crania Americana by this Samuel George Morton. Samuel George Morton is uh, one of the fathers of American ethnography, and essentially what that refers to is scientific racism, um, which is basically the idea that Different cultures, different races have different body parts, different sized brains, and therefore different intellects. So when Samuel George Morton depicted this trepan skull in his book, he never once thought that this could have possibly been ancient surgery, because he just felt that the savages of the ancient world didn't possess the intellect in order to be able to do this. And the real sort of excitement developed in the mid-1860s with Ephraim George Squire. He was appointed by uh, Abraham Lincoln, sent to Peru on sort of a peacekeeping mission to identify different international conflicts. But when he was done doing that, he traveled around Peru and came upon this very wealthy woman in the region of Cuzco, Peru. In her home, she had all these artifacts that she collected, one of which was from a cemetery in the UK Valley. And this is a picture, actually, of the skull that he had found. And it was very clear to Squire that he had found something indicating early surgery. So he took this skull back to New York, brought it to the New York Academy of Medicine, and said, you guys look at this, tell me what you think. He wasn't a doctor, so he said, you guys look this over. They basically looked at it and said, this does look like an operation had occurred, except they didn't really know, was this done after he died, was it done beforehand? 
And this whole idea of brain size and race and intelligence that, that Samuel George Foster was talking about was still going on. And most of the people there thought, there's no way that these ancient people could have possibly done this in any deliberate fashion, that it must be after death. So what Squire did was he sent the skull to Paul Broca. Now Paul Broca, you know, you guys may have heard of Broca's area, and you know, Broca himself was a French physician who was also an anatomist, who also happened to be one of the leading anthropologists at the time. He actually founded the Société d'Anthropologie in Paris in 1860, and is really one of the foremost experts on not only anthropology, but also the brain at the time. So he looked at the skull and he said, no question, this is from a trepanation. However, he saw no fracture, so said that this likely wasn't from trauma, it must be from some other reason. So he took this and said, I'm going to run with this, look at many different skulls, let's find all these different uh, uh, skulls to examine, and try to come up with a reason that this was done. So based on that, he sort of formulated this hypothesis of why cranial surgery was done in the ancient world. And there are four basic reasons that could have occurred. One, therapeutic, meaning there's some obvious trauma. Somebody gets hit in the head, they do some sort of cranial surgery on them. That's fairly obvious. The second one, magico-therapeutic, is more an indirect way of looking at this skull and saying, you know, we see this person and maybe they have a seizure. But we don't understand that seizures come from the brain, so we're going to let the evil demons out of the brain by putting a hole in it. And this was actually, as we'll see, a common thought at the time. Other things, such as magical ritual, meaning it was part of some sort of ceremony, and that's why they did it, having no medical value whatsoever. Or post-mortem, as we saw that debate, maybe they just cut holes in people's heads after they died, and that was the indication for it. So that theory, after Broca looked at this, he decided that trepanation was performed almost exclusively on infants, and that the people who survived, they thought that they possessed some mystical properties, and he was going to go about to prove this. So in his observations of looking at all these skulls, he saw no male or female difference, saw no side preference, and we'll talk about a little bit why that's important later, no wounds on the face, and he did see some survival after this very primitive surgery. He based most of this on this skull that was found by Prunarius. In this skull, it's very interesting. You can see there are essentially three areas, one here, one here, and one here, um, of different types of holes made. And you can see the sagittal suture is sort of displaced over towards this area of trepanation. Because of this, he surmised that this hole must have been made when the child was very young and allowed the skull to grow in that direction. A second thing that he noted is that these sutures, the coronal and lambdoid sutures, were closed. So this child likely grew into adulthood. And the third thing he noticed was that these areas were not healed. And so these areas must have been taken out of the skull after the person died. And this amulet was actually found within the skull. And the pieces that make up this amulet did not come from this skull. So he thought maybe there was some magical property associated with this that caused people to take pieces of skull and use them as amulets or, or some sort of ritualistic purpose. So his conclusions, again, were that infants were operated. There were no fractures that he found. And he didn't think that the early man had any knowledge of the brain or any of the brain function. So he concluded that trepanation was probably performed for infantile seizures. Now, as we know now, infantile seizures occur when babies have increase in temperature or there's some other reason, but they're self-limiting. And so if you have a child with a seizure and you think that you need to drill a hole in their head to cure it, and you do that, and then they don't have another seizure, well, then obviously your drilling worked. And it's not exactly what we know now. We know that these are self-limiting and they would have gone away anyway. But he proposed that that's why this idea of trepanation was sort of carried on. Then came Victor Horsley, who was a little bit later, but a contemporary of Broca, who said, I don't agree with that. I think that it was probably due to some form of trauma. And uh, Horsley himself was one of the fathers of epilepsy surgery. He operated on John Hewling's Jackson's patients, who uh, sort of came up with the idea of Jacksonian seizures where he would remove part of the skull, take a scar away from the brain, and cure seizures. And so when he looked at these skulls, he actually took one skull, 
and drew all the trepanation sites on it and said, it's very obvious to me that every hole that's made is over the motor cortex. Therefore, this must have been done to prevent motor seizure.